KPFA in Fresno and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1.30. Up next, Making Contact. This week on Making Contact. You When hundreds of people turned up to a teach-in called Idle No More in November 2012, the four organizers realized they had started something big. Within months, a movement for indigenous sovereignty and environmental protections had spread across Canada. We always come back to water and land because indigenous sovereignty in Canada right now is the only thing preventing the Canadian state from fully accessing the, the land and the water. On this edition, Sylvia McAdam, one of the organizers of that first teaching, tells the story of Idle No More, from round dance flash mobs to railroad blockades. I'm George Lavender, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. A shopping mall in Saskatoon, Canada. It's winter, and the floor of the mall is crowded with hundreds of shoppers buying Christmas gifts. A group of people begin to drum. A huge circle is formed inside the shopping mall as people hold hands and dance together. Traditional round dances like this one, as well as demonstrations, teach-ins and blockades, swept across Canada in the winter of 2012. The movement became known as Idle No More and began as a protest against new laws curtailing environmental protections, but quickly grew into a national and international movement for environmental justice and indigenous rights. Chief Teresa Spence of the Attawapiskut underwent a six-week hunger strike in support of the movement's demand for a nation-to-nation -nation dialogue between First Nations and the Canadian government. We're living in a third world, and this shouldn't be happening in this country. You know... They're getting rich by our land. Everybody's using our traditional land except us and all these mining companies and other forestries and other things that's been happening in our community. There's no benefit for us. But at the very beginning, Idle No More was four women who resolved amongst themselves not to be silent about what they saw happening to their land and water. One of them was Sylvia McAdam. My name is Sylvia McCadden. I'm from the Treaty 6 territory in what is now known as Canada. Um, I'm from the Nihio people. Uh, in English, we're called the Cree, Cree people, but I am from the Nihio nation. I'm one of the co-founders. There's four founders of Idle No More. Idle No More means protection of indigenous sovereignty and protection of land and water. So that's our, our vision is to keep pressuring leadership not just in Canada, but also uh, globally, that the protection of our lands and our waters is a very critical state. And the, the way that we're extracting resources in many of the indigenous territories in Canada is detrimental to the land and to the water. And we're pushing and pressuring leadership to use, um, start moving towards using... Um, resources that are environmentally friendly. Um, what brought me to that pivotal point was I went back to the land and the traditional lands of my people and I realized from, from that point on there was activities happening that were so devastating to the land. In my mind, when I was growing up as a child, I was thinking of going back to those freshwater streams and those forests and those pristine berry picking lands and the medicines that were growing there. And when I went back there last year, 
a lot of the land was devastated. And when I tried to go back to those those lands where we had hunted and fished, um, I found out that those were being targeted for logging and there was no forest, literally no forest. And then I, I went back to those freshwater streams that had been there before, they were gone, um, they were dried up. And that scared me into action, I think. And I, w I was grieving and so sad that these things were gone. That brought me to that point where when Bill C-45 happened, I was like, no. I, I can't stay silent on this. Uh, we were actually going to call it silent no more, but we thought, well, it was much more than that. It was being idle, so we said we were going to be idle no more. It began as a small social media campaign armed with little more than a hashtag and a cause. The Canada's Idol No More has grown into a large indigenous movement with protests and ceremonial gatherings held almost daily. In swirling snow late cities. last month, they converged oh, on more. Canada's parliament in what became the largest gathering so far in the Idol No More movement. That began in early October with just four Aboriginal women and a Twitter hashtag, and it's grown into nationwide protests. Well, in the early days, um, our first teach-in, we called it a teach-in because uh, the four founders are primarily educators. Um, on November on November 10th, um, we called on, we put it out into the communities that were having an information session on Bill C-45 and about 150 people showed up on our first teach-in and then we shared our information. Aboriginal and environmental activists are teaming up to resist what they say is the conservative Canadian government's attempts to appropriate resource-rich lands and to assimilate Aboriginal nations. They're calling We're not Prime here Mr. Stephen Harper to sign a new funding deal or to make a small package agreement and new funding arrangements. That's not what we're here for. We recognize 140 years of colonial rule in our territory. Well, when you think about it, the movement's really been in, in play for a long time, the use of our lands and resources without our consent. But the kind of spark was this legislative initiative by the Harper government, which uh, started with Bill C-45, but also includes 14 other pieces of legislation that's being imposed on First Nations people without some of it, without their knowledge and consent. But Bill C-45 is, is unique in that it's a large omnibus bill, and it impacts both Canadians and First Nations in terms of protection. What it is in a nutshell is it's an omnibus bill. An omnibus bill is a slew of bills under one document and it's a 450 page um, omnibus bill that was introduced on December 18th and it's unheard of in Canadian Parliament to have a bill move through so quickly and to become, become law on December 14th and to affect the landscape of Indigenous people and Canadian citizens in a way that was far-reaching and the effects are so devastating on so many levels. Um, not only does it affect um, the Navigable, Navigable Waters Protection Act, it also amended the Indian Act in terms of the lands and the redesignation of Indian lands. And when you amend the Indian Act in terms of land and redesignation of a land, you're amending treaty. And this was done without the consultation or the input of Indigenous people that it directly impacts. My name is Audrey Redman and I'm Dakota First Nations from Standing Buffalo, Saskatchewan. To me it's a really exciting time because I think it's a time that First Nations are coming together and we're coming around the same issues which is, a, which is the land and right now of course with the Bill C-45 that's going through and they're trying to push it through and I, I really don't believe that First Nations are going to um, accept any of it now. We may have looked like we've been very, very patient, and we are patient people, but there is a limit to patience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there comes a point when we have to stand up and say, you know, it's enough. 
when people started to realize um, the far-reaching effects of Bill C-45, it created a new consciousness. It created a, a, a protection towards uh, land and water. And I think grassroots people started to realize the kind of connection that came out of, I, I don't know more, um, we became united. We became, um, how should, a united voice in protecting the land and the water. And for many, many grassroots people, um, when they began to realize, um, when they began to have more information about Bill C-45 and all those bills that were going through Parliament, they realized how terrible this bill is and what it's going to do. And I think I Don't Know More created, like I said, the space for them um, to tell the Canadian state that they don't have our consent to put this bill through. I Don't Know More um, gives space for grassroots voice in whatever manner that it chooses to be given that it's peaceful it has to be peaceful ethical moral respectful you know those are the boundaries that we ask and but if if you can follow those boundaries and you have a voice as a grassroots person then you, you know i don't know more is for you more from Sylvia McAdam, a co-founder of the Idle No More movement, after the break. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. I'm George Lavender. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 510-251-1332, extension 108. Because of generous support from listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the US, Canada, Australia, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. Now back to Sylvie McAdam, co-founder of Idle No More, the movement for indigenous sovereignty and environmental protection. We call it a grassroots movement, and it's not exclusively indigenous because if you look at the founders Sheila McLean is of European descent she's not indigenous at all and Sheila brings in that element of um, allies and settler people who are in support of indigenous sovereignty getting non-indigenous people um, to begin supporting those activities like I don't know more to begin questioning the history that's being perpetuated out there and then um, begin informing um, their own nations that what's happening is, is um, affecting all people it's not just indigenous people. I'm on the line right now with Harsha Walia, who's a migrant justice organizer based in Vancouver. Immigrants in support of I Don't Know More is specifically to bring together people from racialized migrant communities who face, you know, a diverse amount of, um, who have a diverse range of struggle, uh, particularly against racism and colonialism um, from people's own homelands and histories, as well as ongoing racism within the Canadian state. And to kind of affirm that presence and allyship with Indigenous communities and to do it from our specific, our specific positionality and, and social location. It's essentially um, a presence um, and asserting that there are many immigrant communities in support of Indigenous rights and I don't know more. I mean, one of the things that we have um, within 
the context and the discourse around indigenous politics, and specifically, I don't know more, um, is that they're, you know, native and non-natives, and the group of non-natives is very large and diverse and has distinct histories and distinct realities. Indigenous sovereignty is all about protection of land and water, and this is how come we're saying it's not exclusively indigenous, because water affects everyone. We always come back to that. If we don't have clean water, if we don't have clean lands, then, you know, we can talk about nationhood and all these different things. All those are a privileged, a privileged dialogue. But at the end of the day, if we don't protect our lands and our waters, those things become not as important. First of all, uh, I always say, uh, before you do something, you need to make it known. So we're doing something now, we're acting, we're making uh, the issue uh, visible, and we're trying to, be, to make people relate between each other. I mean, non-native are as touched by the uh, C-45, C-45 than we are. So, I mean, it, it's just to show we are under the same problem. And now, how can we act together? And also, um, how say, can I say, we are doing action like here we are, because people don't know there are still native people sometimes in Canada. So now it's, what can I teach you? What can I exchange with you? And that's why there's a, it's been started by teaching this movement from the four women that are in Saskatoon that created the idlenomore.ca movement. Uh, so we're going to try to continue. I'm going to try and teach people. They're going to try and teach me. I've learned a lot from other people during this movement. So I feel there it's not... It's it's not just going to be a fade. It's going to be something that's going to be more profound. I think in Quebec, mostly in the province of Quebec, it's already been proven that we're not. We don't want to be idle. It might we be Canadian, Quebecer, or uh, native? <laughs> we don't want to be uh, taken for granted no more. Students, uh, French, uh, Francophones, uh, Quebec, Quebec native, Inu, Algonquin, so. We've had flash mob round dances, and for people who don't know what a round dance is, I invite you to um, go into YouTube and Google I Don't Know More Round Dances, and you'll see a very dynamic uh, visual of drumming and dancing and the round dance itself. As Indigenous people, when we talk about uh, land and water, it's a powerful spiritual connection, and the round dance... Uh, it's been described as a prayer in motion. And when we round dance, we talk about we dance on the land, we dance to the songs of the Creator, and it's all about that connection to land and water, and then uh, that element of our, our ancestors dancing with us. And I think flash mobs are quick and they create a unity because when we dance we hold hands and anybody can join in they're quick they're spiritual and they create a unity i think that's how come they're so, so powerful just to start um can you just introduce yourself my name is charm logan i'm a cree metis living in toronto ontario okay and you're one of the organizers of this yes. uh flash mob here today yeah flash mob round dance we okay. wanted to keep it about unity we want to make new friends with canadian citizens and just start getting everybody together in solidarity so that we can understand the real environmental crisis we're facing in Canada. Okay, so can you actually just tell me a little bit about what was uh, what was this action about today? Well, Hartford government is pushing through some very dangerous legislation that uh, affects our First Nations and Canadian citizens. It's going to impact our environment, particularly our water, and it's time that everybody wakes up and takes some action, and that time is now because there's not much time left. So we gathered everybody today to help bring some awareness to these issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fact that these I Don't Know More actions have been happening all across the country, what does that say to you? It has been a movement of resistance that's been going on for decades, for over a hundred years, and 
it's just so empowering and spiritually moving to see all our people across Turtle Island and the world gathering to recognize that Mother Earth is the most important thing to us. We are from her. She needs care. So the fact that everybody's waking up and idling no more is beautiful. And to be a part of it is amazing. And so can you just tell me a little bit about uh, what, what you guys did today, what, what happened in this flash mob? Well, it was supposed to be a flash mob. We had it planned out quite strategically, except there was way more people than we planned. So there was no discreet sneak up the way we intended it to be. And it just, as you can see, if you were here, it completely took over the intersection and the square. So, I mean, we went from round dance to mosh pit because there was just so many people. And finally, what are you hoping uh, will come out of the, this movement, I don't know more, over the next uh, days and weeks? We need Harper and the Queen to deal with the treaties and the agreements that were put in place. We need the Constitution of Canada to be upheld. People who who haven't come out to the round dances, who have contacted us and said they're having letter writing campaigns and letter writing workshops where they've written to their MPs, they've written to the monarchy, and they've written to the uh, prime minister and the governor general, just letting them know you don't have our consent and all these different things. Um, I'm just saying like the movement uh, growing, growing again and Aboriginal people um, becoming more and more visible. I just wish <laughs> there's going to be more, uh, we're going to raise more awareness about the issues and eventually that there's going to be a real dialogue with the government and the Aboriginal peoples because we're going to continue our actions as long as there's no real dialogue. We've had young people who, um, uh, it, this was one of the very creative elements about I Don't Know More, where they've done, um, they did a, a, a little coffin and they've written um, oppression, racism, Bill C-45 all over it. And then they wrote letters saying goodbye to all of them. And then they, they put the letter in the workshop, in a coffin. And then they carried that coffin and went and buried it. So that's the creativity of grassroots people. In the U.S., our relationship with the indigenous people um, has been strong. So we have I don't know more Minnesota. We have I don't know more Seattle. We've had I don't know more San, uh, San Jose, California. And we've had I don't know more Arizona that we've been connected with. And now we've had we have I don't know more Germany, we have I don't know more uh, London, United Kingdom, and uh, I don't know more Switzerland. So there's very strong ties, not just with the indigenous people, but settler allies from all over the world. This I don't know more movement expanded to the U.S. border Saturday with a series of blockades and actions. Police closed the international bridge connecting Ontario with Michigan after hundreds of protesters marched from the U.S. to the Canadian side. Sit-ins and protests were also held at bridges, roads, rail lines, and other border crossings across Canada. The action we decided that we were going to take peaceful, nonviolent direct action which means we're we're going to do blockades now these blockades have to be strategic prayerful and thoughtful we're not going to do blockades in the middle of like denver we want to target those blockades that have uh, um, roads leading into lands that are directly impacted by activities of resource extraction we're hoping that it'll create attention to the global community that these kinds of resource extractions are not acceptable. They're, they're um, not good for the lands and the waters and that leadership should begin moving towards um, alternative sources of energy they're there they're available we have the technology and we have certainly the resources to begin moving in that direction and that the Canadian citizens indigenous people all people from all walks of life the grassroots people 
are, are protesting these actions of resource extraction, these activities that are they're not acceptable. <laughs> out very quickly that the grassroots voice is in song, in dance, in poetry, in music. We had grassroots people um, come to us and say, I'm not a politician and I, uh, I don't speak in that language. However, I'm a spoken word poet. Can I share a poem that I wrote about um, what these bills mean to me and how they affect me as a grassroots person. And the four founders and I kind of thought about, we're like, well, it's unconventional and certainly not the way things would normally be done, right? So, but we looked at it and thought, okay, let's have a poem be said. And it grew from there. We had other people approach us and say, you know, again, I'm not a politician, but I know how to sing. Can I create a song for I Don't Know More and we said, sure. This one young man, um, he called, he, his hip-hop name is Drezas and he has a song called Red Winter and it's in YouTube. He came to he came to me and he said again he's like you know I don't I, I'm not a, a good speaker and he said can I um, create a song and I said sure and all these different um, voices of the grassroots and we made space for them to have that voice and I don't know more and I think that's what gives it its power and its um, unified voice you are the spark that's starting a fire that will spread across this land and it will be a fire that doesn't burn but a fire that cleanses a fire that ignites in our hearts and creates light no more living in darkness our time now And that's it for this edition of Making Contact. Sounds from Idle No More activists and actions came from Aaron Lakoff and Lillian Bokter. For a CD copy of this program, call the National Radio Project at 510-251-1332, extension 108. Or check out our website, radioproject.org, to get a podcast, download past shows, or make a difference by supporting our work. Like Making Contact on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. Lisa Rudman is our executive director. Chen Chen and Andrew Stelzer are producers. Irene Flores, web editor. Lisa Bartfei, Salima Hamarani and Aaron Mathewson, production interns. And Barbara Barnett, Dan Turner and Alton Bird, volunteers. I'm George Lavender. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. This is Bob Baldock wanting you to know about a delightful event KPFA has arranged. It's about Chef Marcus Samuelson's astonishing journey from Ethiopia, where he was war orphaned at age three, then adopted by a loving Swedish family. He grew up in Sweden, where his new grandmother sparked in him a profound fashion for cooking. 
This led finally to Marcus opening in Harlem the terrifically popular Red Brewster, a truly multiracial restaurant where presidents rub elbows with musicians and athletes, artists and nurses. Henry Louis Gates Jr. says Marcus' life, like his cooking, reflects splendidly diverse influences and educations. He writes about it all with an abundance of flavor, verb. His book is Yes, Chef, a memoir. Meet him in Berkeley, Monday, June 17th, St. John's Presbyterian Church, 2727 College Avenue. Wheelchair access. Advanced tickets only 12 bucks through brown paper tickets.